Gorongosa. Gorongosa happens to be uh, located at the southernmost tip of the Great African Rift Valley uh, that starts in, you know, in Jordan, goes through uh, East Africa, and actually ends in Mozambique, and it ends literally in the city of Beira, which is our, uh, a nearby coastal uh, city. Uh, so we are in this in this very uh, uh, you know uh, southernmost uh, tip of it, and what it means from a biological or biogeographic point of view is that we that uh, life has been channeled through the uh, Great Rift Valley towards us. Uh, so we have this beautiful mix of elements, biological elements. Uh, both East African and North African and South African. So uh, this is one of the reasons why uh, Gorongosa is so incredibly uh, rich biologically. Um, and uh, because the bulk of the park sits at the bottom of the valley, it's, it's a lowland uh, where the elevation is about, uh, essentially it's a sea level uh, elevation, but we are flanked by the uh, two rims of the, uh, of the uh, of, the, of the valley, of the Rift Valley, and what we are looking here at is the western rim, which is which is a granite uh, rim. These are all uh, volcanic uh, rocks, and uh, uh, these formations that you see in this landscape are insulbers. Uh, they're called Bunga insulbers, and they are uh, a place where you find these incredibly rich uh, communities of, of plants and, and animals. Uh, there are some endemics. Uh, we recently described um, uh, new lizards and, and new bats uh, from this habitat. So it's, it's uh, biologically speaking, it's one of the richest places in, in Gorongosa. Right. So, right, Gorongosa, because it has, represents every habitat, obviously that means lots of diversity. And you're, you're saying this particular habitat in Gorongosa is a particularly rich uh, species. Correct. Rich. Yeah. Yes. And then this uh, looks like, um, floodplain so and this, the river? Yes. So this is this is what uh, uh, a lot of the floodplain or the or the or the lowland uh, area of Gorongosa looks like. Uh, this is uh, obviously uh, at the beginning of the dry season where uh, most of the water has already receded. Uh, this area gets completely flooded uh, uh, throughout the uh, the rainy season with which begins uh, usually at the end of, of uh, December and lasts until at least the end of March. Um, so Gorongosa, it's it's a, a water-driven ecosystem. It's, it's incredibly dynamic. Uh, water levels uh, uh, fluctuate. Uh, in a place like this, you would have um, you know s somewhere between three meters of water uh, to zero uh, within a you know a six-month span, mm. uh, and that is also reflected in the uh, composition of the biological communities that live there. Uh, a lot of organisms that live in Gorongosa are perfectly adapted to this, uh, you know, very dynamic nature of, uh, uh, of, of the landscape and, and they, can, they can cope or they have to cope with both, uh, with both the overabundance of water and then occasionally a complete lack uh, lack of water. So uh, again, ecologically speaking, it's it's a it's a phenomenal, uh, phenomenally interesting place. Yeah, it's a very dynamic, changeable, um, and then just beautiful as well. Here's a beautiful waterfall, and um, so so here we are looking at the slopes of Mount Gorongosa. Uh, Mount Gorongosa is uh, the source of three major rivers. Uh, that feed into the park. So we actually depend on Mount Gorongosa on uh, a, a lot of our water. And that's why, that's one of the reasons why uh, Mount Gorongosa um, has been incorporated into the conservancy, into the national park, because we realize how important that, important that place is uh, towards sustaining uh, all that richness of life uh, that we have. Um, so uh, this is the definitely the wettest place uh, within the, our national park. Mount Gorongosa gets at least 2,000 millimeters of, of water uh, in precipitation every year. Uh, so the the forest that the grows there, it's a true, uh, honest to God, uh, rainforest, um, and that's where we find a lot of these these uh, unique uh, organisms uh, that that plant in the in the foreground. It's one of the many species of figs. Yeah. Uh, genus Ficus that we have uh, that we have in Gorongosa, and the, and the place behind it 
It's a Murambozi waterfall where actually, interestingly enough, Ed Wilson uh, conducted his first bioblitz in, in 2011 and uh, he collected the first insect, insect data uh, from Garangoza. Uh, that's, yeah, we have some great film from that bioblitz. Um, yeah, that was really a great event. And now here, so that's, a large yeah, that's plane. another view of the flood plain. Uh, this is a slightly different landscape. This is a landscape that receives a little less water during the rainy season. So we have this woodland, uh, woodland savanna. Um, and this is this is where you find the bulk of our uh, big mammals. This is this is the kind of landscapes that you know elephants love and and uh, uh, a lot of antelopes and, and and lions and so on. So if you want to see you know big big charismatic megafauna, this is where you go. Right. So I I put in some slides here just to make sure people. Uh, no, there are indeed, there is indeed charismatic megafauna in, in the park. Um, do you want to yeah. say just a quick word about the elephants in the park? Sure, sure. Uh, maybe I should just uh, say a, a quick word about uh, our big mammals in general. So as uh, you may or may not know, um, uh, you know, Gorongosa have suffered tremendously from uh, uh, the uh, civil war that, that took place in, in Mozambique in uh, you know, in the 1970s until the early 1990s, uh, which resulted in the loss of uh, probably about 90% or more of our uh, mammalian biomass. But since then, uh, the, the restoration of, of it has been uh, an absolutely, uh, uh, one of the greatest success stories in, in, in conservation in Africa. Uh, the, the, the mammalian biomass now is almost equal uh, to the pre-war levels and uh, the populations of all these animals, including elephants, uh, are climbing very, very, very uh, rapidly. Uh, right now we have uh, probably about, I want to say 750, uh, maybe even a thousand elephants. Uh, so we are relatively very quickly approaching the pre-war levels. Uh, before the Civil War, Gorongosa had uh, 2,500 elephants. And, and we, I'm sure we will reach those numbers very, very soon. Obviously, elephants are not reproducing very fast, uh, so we have to wait. But at this point, uh, their population is almost on, the, on, an, on an exponential uh, part of the, of the uh, uh, population growth curve. Um, so our elephants, uh, a lot of them uh, remember the conflict. Um, and uh, for this reason, some of our elephants uh, are still a bit distrustful uh, towards uh, towards people, um, and uh, uh, this 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 particular individual here that's a, that's a, that's a male that's a, a calm uh, calm little guy, uh, so you don't have to fear him. Uh, but uh, if this were a female, especially a female with a calf, I probably wouldn't try to take this uh, this picture, uh, at least not from a yeah. very uh, close distance. So that's, I mean, so a, a great recovery story. And is it mostly, you know, I know it's hard to, it's probably not right to credit it to one thing, but is it mostly a case of um, the war ending and sort of uh, establishing protections in the park and the, the populations have rebounded on their own? Or uh, is it a very active program of bringing in animals from other places? Uh, the restoration um, started by uh, bringing a limited number of, uh, of, uh, of animals to help augment the, the existing populations uh, of some of the animals. Uh, uh, we brought in uh, a, a few elephants, uh, uh, some eland antelopes, some hippos, some buffalo, and so on. Um, but then uh, a lot of it was simply letting these animals uh, live in peace, uh, protected, uh, you know, left undisturbed, and that has worked uh, quite well. Um, as you said, uh, this has been a tremendously su successful restoration story. Uh, if, I, if I can give you a number uh, as an example, uh, the, uh, one of our uh, greatest successes was the restoration of uh, one of species of antelopes, uh, the, the water buck, after the war, uh, when a, a, an assessment of the population sizes was done, 
uh, only about 300 individuals who count it. Uh, right now, we have over 50,000 of those animals. So, uh, and that's true. Count. Yeah, and that's true for a lot of other species of large mammals that we have to the point that we are now literally giving animals away to other conservancies in, in Mozambique. Uh, because other places also need help uh, with the restoration of their populations. So we've been, every, every year or every other year, uh, we've been uh, capturing and uh, uh, relocating uh, literally thousands of animals, uh, impalas, uh, war, uh, warthogs, uh, waterbuck, uh, and, and, uh, and a few other species. I happened to be in Kruger National Parks again uh, about a year ago, <laughs> and... <laughs> Um, yes, I was disappointed uh, because <laughs> Gorondosa spoils you. Gorondosa really spoils you. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it's, as a biologist, I never promise anybody that they will see something when they go into the field. I cannot promise that you will see whatever a species of an animal um, that might be common in a particular area. But if you come to Gorondosa, I can guarantee you that you will see a lot of certain animals. Yeah. <laughs> because, yeah. because. They really are doing great. That's a great. That's a great tagline. You know, m makes Kruger disappointing. <laughs> uh, th there's important community development things going on. The park is restored. It's a great. It's under. It's continuing to thrive and and um, right. revitalize. Um, and uh, but importantly, and this this photo makes the point. Uh, obviously, it's implicit in talking to you, but it's an important place for research. So. This, for oh. example, is a tagged, um, tagged lion, and so there's lions in the park, but all of this is being studied. I mean, science is a super important activity in this park. Absolutely, absolutely. So Gorongosa, from the very beginning, uh, has decided to base uh, everything we, that we do here on solid science. Uh, and um, I, I was, again, I was incredibly lucky to be able to visit Gorongosa uh, uh, with Ed Wilson uh, about eight years ago or so. And um, at that point, uh, the, the parks management was looking into creating a, a, a facility or a creating infrastructure that would promote a, a science uh, in, in the park. And uh, so I, um, uh, you know, I was given an opportunity to to implement uh, parts of it, parts of the of the strategy, and that's uh, what resulted in the creation of the of the E. O. Wilson uh, Biodiversity Laboratory, uh, where I'm sitting right now. And so, yes, uh, science has always been tremendously important uh, uh, in Gorongosa. We uh, we wanted to create uh, one of the best uh, environments uh, for doing research in in in, in Africa, and. Uh, I, I think we, we've achieved uh, you know, uh, uh, quite a bit uh, in that direction. Uh, they, we currently have uh, long-term relationships with about 30 universities worldwide who have long-term projects in Gorongosa and obviously a lot of shorter-term uh, projects. Um, uh, we, uh, uh, you know, and these projects range in, in, their, uh, in their scope from you know, soil bacteria to, you know, large carnivores and, and uh, you know, the effect of climate change on, on the ecosystem and, and landscape, landscape level ecology and also, you know, phylogenetics and, and, and uh, multi-trophic uh, interactions in the ecosystem. Essentially, any kind of uh, question that has to do with uh, 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 the interactions among the organisms and, and the biotic and uh, and abiotic factors, we probably have a project that asks that that some some particular question in that in that uh, in the lab in the field. So yeah, I mean science uh, science is strong in Barangosa, and we are hoping to expand it more and more. We really want to be uh, the leading force in uh, biodiversity uh, biodiversity science conservation science uh, in Africa. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's yeah, a good example of a, of a seasonal nature of Gorongosa. This is uh, a place that uh, normally is, is as dry as a bone, and this is in the rainy season. Uh, it's a woodland savanna that gets completely flooded, and, and uh, by doing that, it creates an absolutely perfect environment for breeding of a lot of 
of water birds, uh, we have some some of the largest um, uh, colonies, breeding colonies of uh, of water birds uh, in, in in Africa, um, because this is such a safe environment for them. Uh, these uh, these trees being surrounded by water uh, create a barrier to a lot of predators. Uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, a jackal or a hyena or some other predators cannot access those those places because they are underwater. So mm -hmm. so. Uh, this really helps uh, our birds. Oh, and here are some. Here are some mm -hmm. birds. Yeah, these are these are um, uh, saddle-built young saddle-built uh, storks um, hunting in, in on the bloodline. Oh, and then of course there are there are primates. Uh, yeah. yeah, primates. We we have a. Uh, uh, quite a few interesting species of primates. Uh, this is uh, the most uh, abundant and most visible and, and noisiest species. These are our baboons. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, we are not sure what species they are. Uh, there is a there is a research going on right now trying to understand the uh, they their uh, you know phylogeographic provenance, so to speak. Uh, we are probably in the a hybrid zone between two species of baboons uh, because our baboons are uh, morphologically uh, more related to more East African species called the yellow baboon, but uh, genetically are, are more, uh, uh, appear to be closer to the chakma baboon in Southern Africa, or South Africa. So there is a group of researchers looking into all aspects of their uh, biology and genetics. Uh, obviously, they are fantastic organisms to study. Uh, the evolution of, of social behavior social behavior so we have a team that works on on baboons and, and tries to answer all kinds of questions uh, related to their origin and and, and behavior hmm. good expression that's that's a young baboon that's uh, that's uh, as you can imagine this is the the rainy season where water is scarce and and so the, you only have this kind of a uh, muddy little uh, water holes where animals congregate to get the, uh, the, a sip of water. These, yeah. these watering holes actually are, are some of the best places to watch wildlife because you know everybody comes to them. Uh, and this is where also where a lot of um, fish get trapped uh, uh -huh. and so uh, 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 birds such as storks and, and marabous and so on congregate there and, and, and feed on fish. Uh, we happen to have uh, you know, an incredibly rich uh, bat fauna. Bats, as I'm sure you know, are incredibly important members of almost any ecosystem uh, in various different roles as pollinators, seed dispersers, uh, you know, predators of insects. Um, the net effect of bats is unequivocally positive. Uh, they are extremely beneficial uh, organisms and so we are studying them uh, here quite a lot in Gorongosa. Uh, we've documented about 50, I believe the current number is 51 or 52 species of bats, including several species new to science. Uh, we described uh, 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 one new species from Mount Gorongosa a couple of years ago, and, and we have another paper in, uh, in press now that we'll be describing another species from Mount Gorongosa. So that's already two endemic species to that incredible mountain. Uh, this uh, uh, this bat in the photo, it's called a butterfly bat, as you can guess why, because it's so gorgeously uh, uh, colorful. Um, and, um, uh, you know, the, we are uh, looking into many different aspects of, of bat biology. We are uh, looking at their behavior, their uh, seasonality, and of course we are also not uh, neglecting, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the health aspects of it. We are screening them for, for viral load. Uh, as you can imagine, this is a very important topic that we are very much interested in. Um, so uh, we are looking at uh, what they can potentially carry. Uh, it is important to say at this point, obviously, that um, vets are not responsible for what's happening now. It's not their fault. Uh, and also as a side note, there is not a documented case anywhere in the world of a direct transmission of, of a virus from a bat to a human. Right, of direct Just transmission, that. right. So that's why it's important to understand the full depth and complexity of the ecological relationships and organisms 
trade viruses, and um, it's a it's it's important to understand all the, uh, what's going on in that in those interrelationships, but also th to understand the total role of any given organism in the in the overall right. ecology. I think yeah. you had another. This is this one. Is, oh, this is a different bat, but skimming the water for a drink right. or for food. Uh, no, for drink. Uh, this wow. this bat is drink. Uh, this uh, these we don't have. We don't really have fishing bats that would collect their food from the water. Right. Uh, they they come to water to drink. Uh, they obviously also hunt for insects, aquatic insects that fly above the surface. But this this bat is uh, is is just drinking. About is there a connection between your photography and your research, or the way you engage with nature in general? I mean, yes, obviously there is a connection because, uh, you know, I, I very early on discovered that uh, imagery is one of the best uh, ways of uh, sending a conservation message. Um, I use photos in many different ways, both in my, you know, professional work as an entomologist to document the organisms and uh, so on. But also, if you want to convince people that something is worthy of, you know, fighting for, uh, there is nothing better than showing a picture like this uh, yeah. to show them these incredible organisms and explain that this is why we do it because these unique, fantastic uh, animals need our help. Um, and, um, and by putting the spotlight on them, uh, you, you make them real. You you, you make people yeah. care about them and, and then become invested into in that effort to, to protect them. That's right, this, this photo captures it captures a story. You have immediate engagement and empathy and questions. It's really, it's really good. Think of Garangosa, and when we talk about Garangosa, we think of this park as being a park for the people. Uh, we very quickly realized that you cannot do effective conservation if uh, that effort does not benefit people living around this place. So uh, in addition to the you know, strictly biodiversity related work, uh, we are also doing everything that we can to improve the life of people who live around Barangosa and, uh, you know, and in Mozambique in general. Um, and a big part of it is, uh, it is an effort to elevate um, the, you know, the status of people living here, uh, 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 improving their uh, standard of living. And as I'm sure you know, one of the best way of doing that is by elevating their educational level. So we've put a lot of emphasis on training of, uh, of Mozambican, Mozambican students and, and, you know, other people in, in the country. And uh, we doing we're doing it at many different levels, uh, beginning from you know very young kids. Uh, we have a training program that allows kids living in communities around the park, and there are about two hundred thousand people living around the park, uh, to come in here, understand what we are doing, understand the significance of this of this conservancy, how it impacts their life, how it makes uh, their life better. Uh, uh, we literally built schools. I mean, I, I cannot think of any other national park in the world that builds schools and hospitals and helps, you know, uh, farmers uh, around. So anyway, so, so we do all this. And, uh, and then at the top of that effort is a higher education. We have created uh, the world's only uh, higher education program uh, entirely within uh, the boundaries of, of a national park. Uh, it's the bioeducation program uh, that we started a few years ago, and that includes training uh, 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 master, uh, master's uh, uh, students in conservation biology. And um, uh, uh, part of it is uh, training students in modern uh, research techniques, uh, such as molecular biology and, and other tools. Uh, so these two uh, young scientists that we see here is Marina Vicente and uh, Ricardo Guta. Uh, Ricardo, by the way, is one of the first half Earth scholars. Uh, I'm extremely proud of, of him and, and of Marina. 
Um, and uh, what they're doing here is uh, they are receiving a training in uh, genetic barcoding. They are learning how to extract DNA, how to amplify it, and what to do later with the, uh, with the sequences. Uh, they, they will uh, apply these, uh, this knowledge and these techniques to their uh, future work. Uh, Norina's specialty is, is ants. Uh, Ricardo is interested in grasshoppers and uh, both are trying to answer uh, pretty complex questions about um, not only their relationship within those, those groups but also their ecological uh, roles. Um, so this is just uh, part of the toolbox that they are receiving here, uh, the, uh, developing, uh, you know, within our educational, uh, uh, you know, educational program. Yeah, so it sounds like, right, so these, these community um, connections that span all the way from just getting people to living around the park to recognize they have a stake in the park, uh, the park is, is theirs, all the way up to training the scientific workforce of the future for Mozambique. And so you're, you're building the capacity of uh, Mozambicans to work in the park and then to, um, uh, to also spread, uh, you know, spread the work to the rest of, at, at least to the rest of Mozambique, if not the world, it sounds like. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. I, I, I need to mention that uh, this February, uh, the first cohort of our master's students graduated and all, almost all of them uh, were essentially snatched to start working in many different exciting places. Uh, one of our students is now leading science in our, uh, 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 I should call it a sister a national sister park. park. Uh -huh. in, yeah, in Shimani Mani on, on the border with, with, with Zimbabwe. Another, uh -huh. uh, uh, another of our alumni works in, uh, in the Basaruto National Park. Other students uh, went to, to universities and got uh, jobs as, as scientists and lecturers and so on. So uh, the, the, the seeds that the, the, the we are planting are already sprouting and we are already, uh, soon we will have the second generation of uh, uh, you know, highly educated Mozambicans trained by our alumni. Yeah, so this is that, that uh, aspect of, of uh, education that starts at the very, very uh, young age, uh, we uh, uh, literally every year we bring thousands of kids into the park uh, to teach them about, you know, the significance of, of having protected areas. And we also trying to make it cool for them. And, and so Ricardo is telling them all about insects and, and other small, interesting organisms. And they are just, uh, you know, in rapture. They, they, they love it. They, yeah. you know, every kid that comes here, uh, leaves as a as a budding biologist and and as a matter of fact uh, a lot of our students and um, interns um, uh, they started by just coming here at the younger age and becoming in inspired and one of one very very important uh, aspect of uh, that type of interactions to what, what Ricardo is doing is showing these young kids especially girls that a, education is important, and B, it's a viable path uh, for development, for, for a career. Um, you know, uh, if you ask uh, uh, some of these, these girls, uh, you know, can you make a living, you know, studying the animals, they would say no. And, and we are showing them that, that this is something that can be done, and if they are uh, uh, interested, then we definitely wholeheartedly support them. Uh, to that extent, uh, we have created a network of what we call girls clubs uh, that focus, focus specifically on giving uh, uh, girls in communities uh, around Barangos an opportunity to stay in school, improve their education, and if possible, uh, go on and, and uh, get even more of it. Uh, so that they do not get stuck in this vicious cycle of becoming, you know, mothers at the age of 15 and never having a chance to develop fully as, you know, human beings and, and highly educated uh, people and, and highly educated members of the community. So, so we put a lot of emphasis on empowering these, these young girls and uh, making them, you know, uh, res you know uh, uh, essentially masters of their own fate. Right. Being in this park and 
you know, waking up every morning here, I, I constantly feel like I'm a, a kid in a candy store. Uh, I'm an entomologist by training and insects obviously are my first love, but everything here is fascinating. I, you know, <laughs> I, uh, I work on, on a number of different projects, uh, some of them on insects, but I also am very much interested in, in, in other groups. I work on reptiles and, and mammals and, and just pretty much everything that lives here. Uh, but my particular area of, of expertise and, and specialty is, is, is insects, uh, especially singing insects, singing insects such as grasshoppers, crickets, and, and katydids. Um, as a biologist, I'm, I'm very much interested in the evolution of, of their communication, uh, evolution of the acoustic behavior, uh, uh, how they do it, why they do it, why sometimes they stop doing it. And so, uh, you know, I, uh, I'm also interested in, in just, just their diversity, their diversity, their uh, biogeography. Um, I, I love discovering new species and describing them. And obviously, Garangosa is full of them. Um, I'm also interested in, in interactions uh, uh, among, among insects and um, you know, between insects and other, and other organisms. Uh, uh, the, uh, you, you know, it's, uh, and every, every group that you look at uh, has something in, 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 interesting about it, and there's something new, something that nobody has ever either noticed before or, or hasn't been studied in, in depth. So, um, yeah, you know, I, it's, it's right. there's, there's so many different things that, that I would love to do. <laughs> oh, and I, I love well, it sounds like you're the right you're the right person to 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 be there, and in, I know that part of your effort is simply to continue to record, you know, uh, to build a record of what lives in the park and to discover new species in the park. And naturally, a lot of them are going to be insects. Well, when you think about why uh, animals make sound, and there are essentially three reasons for it, and the most important one being obviously communication within a species. They talk to each other. And um, it's, you know, sound is an incredibly effective way of communicating. Uh, if you want to attract a mate, you don't have to, you know, sit fully exposed and wave your arms and flash things, because uh, not only will your potential mate notice you, but also the predators will, uh, will notice you. So sound is like this magical device that allows you to send a message without being seen. And so, uh, and obviously this is why birds sing. This is why we talk. This is, you know, why crickets sing. Uh, again, very, very effective way of sending messages over long distances. And so, you know, every now and then you notice that some of them, some species or lineages suddenly stop doing that. And so I've always been interested in, in why that happens. And, and there are many re reasons why that happens. So a lot of it is avoidance of, um, uh, specialized predators who eavesdrop on those singing insects and target them. You know, there are, there are several uh, groups of organisms that evolve the ability to listen uh, for, you know, to, to, to singing insects and, and pinpoint them and, and eat them or parasitize them. So, so stop, uh, stopping the uh, production of sound is, is a way of avoiding uh, being targeted by them. But there's also a lot, uh, a lot about, uh, you know, that has to do with acoustic competition. Uh, you know, sound or the sound space, it's a niche, you know, with, uh, with a limited uh, bandwidth, so to speak. So, so there's, there's a, a strong competition uh, uh, among animals for particularly, uh, uh, you know, uh, for the best bandwidth, you know, uh, the, the frequency of the, of the sound um, carries differently in different environments. So animals compete for the best bandwidth. So, and if you lose that competition, then you have to switch to some other mode of communication. And that's what also sometimes happens. Uh, some insects realize, realize in the evolutionary terms, uh, that uh, sound is not the most effective way of attracting uh, made so they switch to something else, be the visual or substrate borne communication or chemical communication and so on. So this is, it's a fascinating topic of, uh, you know, why would you abandon such a uh, uh, potentially very, very effective mode of communication? Hope to accomplish by, by being a, by being a uh, Half Earth Project. 
scientific right. chair. Well, it, it is an incredible honor uh, uh, to be selected to, to become the, the first half uh, Earth uh, chair. And uh, I will try to do my best <laughs> to promote the, the ideas of it. And, uh, it, you know, that, that you know, the half Earth, uh, the, the concept of half Earth and the approach uh, that half Earth has adopted it has a tremendous appeal to me because I, I come from a, a perspective or, or a point uh, uh, that um, I believe that in order uh, to con protect something effectively, you need to know that it exists. So the first step in effective conservation is mapping, is mapping life. Uh, and, the, on the, and the finer the scale you can do it on, uh, the better, the more effective your strategies can be. And this is what we have been doing in Garangosa. One, you know, one of the jobs that I'm responsible for here for is this fine-grained mapping of life of Garangosa. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to scale it up. We can scale it up to the level of the entire country, the entire continent, and then the entire globe. Um, and that will give us, uh, and I know that Half Earth is already doing that, and we are super happy to be part of it, um, you know, once we have this extremely detailed map of life on Earth, then we can really start uh, implementing uh, or prioritizing, uh, you know, our conservation actions. Uh, you know, the, the, the more precise you can pinpoint the spot where, uh, you know, where you get this sort of the, 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 the most bang for, for your conservation buck, help create this, this force, this, this, this group of people uh, who will first of all, generate biodiversity data, become expert in, in biodiversity discovery, description, uh, and, and also uh, ultimately conservation. Uh, so I, I hope to be able to train as many uh, Mozambican students as possible uh, to become uh, taxonomic and biological experts. Uh, they themselves will have students and, and uh, uh, hopefully very soon we'll be able to generate a tremendous amount of data uh, that in the end uh, will steer conservation to, uh, towards a, a far more effective uh, path. And uh, in the end, we'll be able to save uh, everything that we are now, uh, now documenting. So uh, it's all, you know, it's a combination of, you know, on the ground, uh, you know, field work, science, a lot of it is education, and a lot of it is changing the the mindset of people, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier that we are trying to uh, make uh, Mozambican students realize that science is a viable career path and one that uh, that leads to, you know, great things, not just for themselves, but to, you know, for the planet and for their communities and the yeah. country. And I love that, using it to make a difference um, and and do specific things where you are. But we, we of course, also, uh, you know, hope we know that it will be an example to others and help to connect these efforts um, going on across the world and help people see how their efforts fit in to this overarching goal of, of half earth um, for the entire planet. And um, Gorongosa is just such a fantastic example of what, what can happen. Um, you just have to keep working at it. <laughs> yeah. Well, Peter, thank you so much. And I know we'll, We'll, we'll talk some more, but um, for now, I w wish you the, the very best and uh, want to thank you so much for, for agreeing to have this session. It was a pleasure. Thanks, thanks and great talking to you guys.